Today on Studio One, many women are assaulted each year in the U.S. We'll spend a day in the life of someone who wants women to fight back. Also, we'll take you back to the time when two of your best friends were a horse and a six-shooter. And terrorism has become a growing concern since September 11, 2001. We'll tell you how some in the medical field are preparing for a possible attack. From the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, this is Studio One. Hello everyone and welcome to Studio One. I'm Monty Cashel. And I'm Carrie Verstall. Well, we're excited for this show yes, because we uh, we've, re we've reached a certain point. 300 shows. 300 shows. <laughs> That's almost 17 years we've been on the air. It's a long time. It is a long time. Yeah. A lot of people have come through here as interns working on different stories and positions on the project. Right, so it's... I'm really excited. For yeah, this and there show. are you'll actually notice during the show we're going to have some greetings from some of those alumni and actually talk to one of the co-founders of the program. Interesting. We've got a lot of great content for you coming up on the show today. Many airlines are having money troubles. We'll tell you how this impacts aviation students. Also, we'll talk with the person who wanted television experience and help create this very show. Before we get to all of that, here's today's news with Phil Zubrod. Thanks, Monty and Carrie. Residents of Florida are still working to clean up the mess left by Hurricane Jean. President Bush returned to the state Thursday for a fifth time to survey the damage. During his visit, Bush stopped at a local relief shelter, spoke with residents about the recovery efforts, and offered them comfort and the hope of financial help. The president is asking Congress for a $12.2 billion relief package. I urge the Congress to pass my supplemental requests quickly so the people of Florida can get the help they need. Florida is also the stage for Thursday night's presidential debate. President Bush will square off with Democratic challenger John Kerry in Miami for the first of three debates. A lot is at stake for both candidates. Recent polls show that nearly 20 percent of American voters say the debates will make a difference in their vote. Bush is looking to build on his nine-point lead over Kerry. During the debate, Kerry says he hopes to clarify his campaign platform. By 2012, the number of people eligible to retire will be triple the number of people able to work. This is already forcing many people over 55 to continue on working far past the minimum retirement age. Many college students are choosing majors such as computer science and engineering. That is making it harder for some employers, like the Postal Service, to fill their job vacancies with young people. The post office in Grand Forks, North Dakota, has seen four employees retire in the last year, but many others are still staying on. We have uh, the majority of the, uh, the older employees are eligible to retire. I do have eight here right now uh, that can retire or could have retired. Many churches may also be affected by a shortage of clergy, and the National Restaurant Association is projecting a shortage of employees. Overweight Britons trying to trim their waistline may soon be able to cut their taxes as well. A group of British doctors is calling on their government to offer tax breaks for people who exercise. The goal of this proposal is to encourage obese people to start working out by making membership fees for health clubs more affordable. Currently, more than one-fifth of British adults are obese. The tax breaks would supplement a program that offers discounts to gyms and health clubs if a doctor prescribes it. Critics say the tax breaks would only benefit people who already can afford to join a health club. More than 26,000 employees were laid off by major airline carriers last year. This leaves not only current pilots, but future pilots searching for opportunities in a changing field. Joe Regal has dreamed of flying for a major airline since he was three years old. That's all I've ever wanted to do for pretty much as long as I can remember. But with many of the major carriers filing bankruptcy, Regal and many other students are beginning to look elsewhere for career opportunities. We have a lot more students who are uh, researching the industry a lot more closely than uh, maybe students of the past to find out what the career paths are. Although the outlook isn't encouraging for major airlines, business is booming for the smaller regional carriers. Pilots with these carriers are seeing increased pay, better job stability, and earlier advancements. When I uh, first started learning how to fly, I was doing it as a way to get to the larger airlines, but the more I fly, the more I'm beginning to think that I'd be willing to fly, you know, small planes. And while larger airlines do offer what some feel to be a more appealing career path, many pilots say jumping ahead isn't worth the risk. 
so unstable there that they don't know. They might get the extra pay, but they might not have a job next week. People are not going to quit flying in this country until we create transporter machines like Star Trek uh, where you can be beamed to Cleveland. Uh, the only way to get there is either to drive or fly. And for Joe Regal, that means still being able to fulfill a lifelong dream. I'm Megan Floggin, reporting for Studio One News. A congressional bailout for the major airlines has been proposed, but is unlikely to pass because of lack of, com of congressional support. And that's the news for now. Monty and Kerry? Thanks, Phil. Well, I reached a, uh, I don't know, a point this year that I hadn't had to yet. What's that? This past week, I had to scrape some ice and frost off of my windshield. I did too, but you know, I think it's just a sign of fall. I it think is. it's a sign. It's kind of nice mm -hmm. to get into that. Well, All the trees are changing now. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we go to Aaron Swanson over at the Regional Weather Information Center, and he can tell us more about what's going on outside. Yeah, well, thanks, Monty and Carrie. Yeah, it was pretty early, I thought. I don't like seeing that frost on my windshield either, I guess. But anyway, we can take a look at our almanac conditions across much of North Dakota. We're sitting in the mid, or mid to lower 60s is our average high, and our overnight lows are in right below 40 degrees, 39 for almost everywhere, except Bismarck, you get to be 37, I guess. Uh, in Denver, 72 for your average high, 67 in Portland, 64 in Minneapolis, and in Winnipeg, 13 degrees Celsius is your average high. Well, we had a pretty bizarre pattern that's set up in the last two months. Uh, two months. We've seen three hurricanes that have crossed over Florida and actually they've been affected by four hurricanes. We have Hurricane Charlie which started out uh, way down south of the Dominican Republic and it went through the western uh, area of Florida and then we had Hurricane Francis which made landfall onto the eastern side and then also we had Hurricane Jean which has our, been our latest uh, hurricane that has crossed over into Florida and as you can see right almost in the middle of Florida just west of Orlando has been crossed at least three times by hurricanes, they've probably seen three eye walls that have crossed over that single location. So kind of an odd uh, time of year actually for that to be happening. So as we take a look here, we had some uh, reports in Haiti and Puerto Rico, and this is of Hurricane Jean, uh, and also into the Dominican Republic. They had seen wind speeds of 105 miles per hour. They were a category two storm. They had widespread flooding, and there were also lots of mudslides in that area as well. And also there was almost a thousand people that were killed in Haiti, and there's still some missing actually as of right now. So, but in Florida, we saw 120 miles an hour winds as it made landfall. It was a category three, and this has been the fourth hurricane in six weeks to affect parts of Florida. So they've seen tons of rainfall and lots of wind and damage in that area as well. Well, here's from where it's going to be warmer, colder. We're going to see cooler conditions into the northern uh, plains and also into the northern Rockies and into the southern Texas region and also into Louisiana. Some warmer conditions, though, out into Florida and also into the southwest region. As we head on in where it's going to be wet or dry, most of the country is going to be pretty much average. Little wetter conditions into southern Texas and also into Florida as well. Here's a, re a look at our studio and weather IQ question. How many days in the last two months have we not seen a named storm in the Atlantic? Uh, and we're going to let you decide on that. We'll have the answer to that coming up in the second half of our show. And also some footage on storm surge as well. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Well, there has been so many hurricanes. In if, the, it's so, absolutely mind-boggling how many hurricanes have hit Florida in the past. Right. And hopefully they're done for the season. Yeah, hopefully. I hope so too. A lot of damage. Right. Well, let's move on now to sports with Greg Anchors. Thanks, Monty and Kerry. Milestones allow us to reflect on what we've accomplished. For Atlanta Braves manager Bobby Cox, he was on the brink of a major milestone heading into Wednesday's game, just one win shy of 2,000 in his managerial career. To the big game in Atlanta we go, and Adam Heilman is on the mound for the Mets, and he's going to want this pitch back as Adam LaRoche goes deep and gone for his 12th homer of the year, tying the game up at two. In the seventh, Andrew Jones up looking to break that tie, and he sends one deep to left center field. Not enough to go out, but a deep enough so one run will score, and the Braves would not look back after they got the lead as John Smoltz comes in in the ninth with the strikeout there as the Braves win this one 6-3. to three. And for Bobby Cox, he does it. He gets his 2,000th win in his managerial career. He is the ninth manager to do so in the big leagues. In the NL wild card, the Astros looking to capitalize on the Giants and Cubs losses on the day and Jeff Kent another milestone here with his 300th career home run as the Astros take this one 6-4 to four and are now a half game up in the NL wild card. And out west in the American League, Anaheim and Texas and Troy Gloss with a game winning homer here for Anaheim as the Angels go on to win this one 8-6 and Anaheim is now one game up on Oakland in the west. Athletes and those who exercise have more options at refueling than ever before. Sports drinks have become a billion dollar a year industry and rival with water as the most popular way to replenish those who work out. 
But with so many brands of sports drinks on the market, dietitians say athletes need to make the right choice. Carbohydrates are a major key to the effectiveness of sports drinks, and athletes should be aware of how much is necessary when working out. A good range is kind of in that six to maybe eight um, percent carbohydrate range um, being a good level. Um, less than that, maybe not being quite enough, more than that, maybe being too many. Michelson also says for sports drinks to be the most effective, athletes should drink them only after a strenuous activity has begun and it should last for more than 30 minutes. And now it's time for the Studio One Sports Trivia question. Keep it along the line here of sports drinks and we want to know what year was Gatorade invented? And we'll tell you what year this historic drink made its debut for athletes when we have more sports later on. Monty and Kerry? Thank you, Greg. Coming up, we'll take a look at a movie that shows what it's like to risk your life to save others. And we'll talk with the person who came up with the idea of making a show called Studio One. Hello Studio One from KVLY-TV in Fargo, North Dakota. Congratulations on your 300th show. Studio One helped us get to where we are today. So keep up the great work. And again, congratulations. congratulations. Need to plan an entire conference? Want to provide your employees with professional training and development? The Division of Continuing Education at the University of North Dakota provides quality programs and services for career enhancement. Whether you want to attend educator workshops or need a certificate for your profession, the Division of Continuing Education can help you achieve success. Contact the Division of Continuing Education today and let us meet your professional needs. When you graduate from college, what will you be able to offer an employer? Well, I'm a really good people person. I really love working with people. I'm very, very motivated. I'm a great people person. I am really motivated. Offer an employer something more. At the University of North Dakota Career Services Center, we can help you get the competitive edge you need. Stop in or check us out. UND Career Services, empowering students to realize their dreams. Did I mention I'm great with people? The University of North Dakota College of Business and Public Administration offers real degrees for real people. Our nationally recognized faculty can help you earn a master's degree in business through evening classes. Taking these evening classes were very convenient for me and that's how I was able to complete the program. We offer degrees for people who work, raise families and lead busy lives. The UND College of Business and Public Administration, real degrees for real people. Become a leader in healthcare with a graduate degree from the University of North Dakota. The Graduate School at UND offers degree programs and advanced practice certificate programs in the allied health professions and nursing. Our faculty give you the individual attention you need to help you attain your career goals. Distance programs for practicing professionals allow you to pursue graduate studies without interrupting your career. Contact the UND Graduate School today. The School of Engineering and Mines at UND has a long history of preparing students for successful careers. Through small classes and faculty involvement, students have unique opportunities to gain hands-on experience. Here students launch a weather balloon to test a remote imaging device destined for Earth orbit. Students can also become involved in wind energy and fuel cell projects, design, build and race a Formula One car, or even develop a camera that will generate agricultural images from the International Space Station. Find out for yourself how you can get involved at UND School of Engineering and Mines. This show, Studio One, started because of a college student. After almost 17 years of production, today we are celebrating our 300th show. I had a chance to talk to the person who came up with the idea to create Studio One. Tom, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. You bet. Congratulations. Yeah, well it's a, it's a great milestone for us, 300 shows, and you have a big part of that. You were here in the beginning and you're the founder of this program and that's why we have you here today to celebrate. Uh, tell us how it all started. How did Studio One start? Uh, 1987, the year prior to that, I think it was 1987. See, that, that dates me, that tells me how old I am. <laughs> I think it was either 86 or 87. Um, the university, to be brutally honest, Monty, did not have anything for broadcast college graduates that wanted some type of repetition in training, uh, basically an internship. And again, to be brutally honest, the stations, at least at that time, and keep in mind, this was a good 14, 15 years ago, their level of expertise, their uh, level of training competence 
was literally non-existent. When I went to them to get an internship, they simply could not provide one. Uh, so we decided let's do it in-house, right place at the right time, have a very close friend, Barry Brody, who at that time I didn't know from Adam, was running the place, said if you got some ideas, put them on paper. We did, and essentially at that time we started a Good Morning America for the college market, and the rest, as they say, is history. Right, is history, and a lot of history since then. Now, when you started this whole thing up, you were a full-time student at the time. Yep, full-time student. And it's enough for students to take college classes yeah. and do the regular stuff they do in school, but to start up a television show, what all did you have to get in place before you could hit air? Well, it was a lot of paper paperwork, a lot of uh, conceptualizing ideas. It meant literally drawing out on paper, logos, uh, design ideas. I can't say enough about the team that we had in place at that time. Barry Brody, Dale Rickey uh, will always fall very, um, very dear to my heart. Uh, Dale stapled, glued, taped that, that whole studio together. And uh, Barry, uh, I know for me, allowed me, gave me room to be creative, to take an idea, constant support from the man. And um, it, it, obviously things fell into place at the right time. Now, once it did all fall into place and you finally hit air with your first show, what was that like for you? <laughs> well, you break the tape. You put all this, you, you wonder, can we really pull this off? And we did on that particular Thursday afternoon, if I remember, uh, extremely rewarding. There was countless hours put into the project before we went to air, uh, paid off. The, the thing I remember about the first show is uh, our, our weathercaster at that time, uh, a college student, she uh, dressed that it matched the chroma key wall. So all we saw were her head and her hands. And Beautiful. so, uh, yeah, it, and I'm still, it, it probably still shows as an example today, the students that are there, what not to dress, what not to wear. <laughs> exactly. Now, you were actually able to get a job at the TV center here, which produces the show, right after you got out of college to continue on. Um, how did you see the show progress from that first show? I uh, saw it progress terrifically. I had a challenge and a big decision to make upon graduation, Monty. I'm not originally from northern Minnesota or North Dakota, so I... Um, I was already looking at leaving at that time, and I was so enthused and rewarded with what we had done over a semester's time. I think the visionary in me whet the appetite to see how far could we go with this. The door was open on that. We had the blessing from the university president, from deans, and one thing led to another. We saw phenomenal growth in a span of, of the five years that I committed to after graduation, where we took it from a half hour, pretty pathetic piece of work to something that at least posed as a very credible uh, reference point. Um, out of interest, I would often send tapes of our shows out to people in the industry to get evaluation on. And at that time, we knew that there was something very valuable in putting a show together, a morning show that you're able to incorporate all facets of television for interns like the ones that you have now. And the feedback we got was extremely positive and it was enough to, enough to stick around and watch it develop. Well, and you mentioned the intern experience. That's one of the parts that actually our viewing audience doesn't see a lot of is this is a show, but it's actually a, an experience for college students to go through. When you were here working with students, what were some of the priority things you wanted to teach them? Well, hands down, you know, and I'll still hold to this, more than the actual ability, whether you're on air, off air, directing, production, was issues of professionalism. And I know that's something still incorporated into the Studio One culture. I can't rave enough about that. Still to this day, professionalism and excellence to me, having a mentality to work together, uh, not fly solo, is, um, was stressed at that time. Uh, probably almost to a fault, but the feedback that we got uh, continually from students at that time was thanks for teaching me. And we, I think we still hear that from students. And when I run across it in, in this business and the station I'm currently with, um, they manifest excellence and professionalism to the letter. Uh, it's pretty rewarding to see. Well, Tom, I don't think you, you have any idea of what your idea has spawned because, you know, we've been on the air now almost 17 years and there are many, many people that really appreciate the opportunity to work at something like this and it's all because of your great idea and we truly appreciate you taking time out today to talk to us out of your busy schedule. Anything lined up uh, for you? Quick synopsis of what you've done since there. You've been gone 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. I had a, I've, I've, had a, I've, done, I've achieved almost everything that I've wanted to in television. I had a great run in Seattle, seven eight years as a lead sports anchor, sports director, uh, saw the Mariners literally nearly leave town, turn into a baseball town, um, have done coaches shows, have done, uh, raised a 19-year-old shortstop named Alex Rodriguez into the prime of his career. 
Uh, I've had all kinds of experiences and I am now in a place that uh, my family and I absolutely love and work at a station I'm extremely proud of being involved with. So I've had a, I've had a great run. Well, thanks a lot again, Tom. We appreciate it and good luck in your future and we'll keep you posted on ours. Thanks and congratulations. Thanks, Tom. Coming up, we'll talk to someone who helps decide what kinds of things people download from the internet. Also, we'll spend some time with an instructor who may save your life. Hello Studio One from WDAZ-TV in Grand Forks. We're proud to be alumni of Studio One and we wish you the best on your 300th show. Congratulations. Congratulations. Earn a degree in engineering while you continue to work. The University of North Dakota's Distance Engineering Degree Program offers the only ABET accredited undergraduate degree program at a distance. Instructors and classes are delivered to you through online lectures and condensed on-campus laboratories. It's convenient, it's flexible, and it's a quality education. UND Continuing Education and the School of Engineering and Mines. Teaming up to bring quality education to your door. Need to plan an entire conference? Want to provide your employees with professional training and development? The Division of Continuing Education at the University of North Dakota provides quality programs and services for career enhancement. Whether you want to attend educator workshops or need a certificate for your profession, the Division of Continuing Education can help you achieve success. Contact the Division of Continuing Education today and let us meet your professional needs. Joaquin Phoenix stars in the new film Ladder 49. His character gets trapped inside a burning building. John Travolta plays the fire chief who struggles to save his best friend. As the flames get worse, Phoenix's character looks back at his life. He remembers back to the good times he had when he first started to his present situation. He also reflects on how he has tried to balance his love for his wife and his love for his career. Phoenix says the sets were like the real thing. What meant the most was that the firefighters uh, who came to visit the set, they walked through and they said that's exactly it. This is exactly how these apartments look. The film was shot in the city of Baltimore. The burning warehouse used for the film looks so real that people called to report the fire. Ladder 49 opens in theaters October 1st. Now it's time to take a look at the events happening in your area. The Family Violence Prevention Fund says one in every three women experience domestic violence or sexual assault in their lifetime. Educators are using different methods of teaching self-defense to reduce that number. A foam beast is lurking around the corner. This creature is stalking its unaware prey. Suddenly, an attack is sprung, forcing the victim to the ground. Tom Erickson assaults women. We want them to believe that we are a bad person at times because we want them to become adrenalized. Participants say that adrenaline rush is what gives them the will to fight. 
Tom's goal is to give a lesson where students can believe in the strength of themselves. We need to figure out a way to try to get them out of their, their protective environment and into a situation where they truly explode. It's good that they're intimidating and they make you feel like you just want to just beat the, beat the crap out of them. A random bruise may appear from time to time, but the confidence of the students is worth any battle. Tom has been pushed, shoved, and bumped a lot. Tom's hope is that all the drilling and practice will save the life of one more victim in an alarming situation. They really realize they always had the tools. We just give them a chance to try them out in a, in a full force situation. Even though Tom may look like a big scary giant, his passion is to encourage others to be safe. By the end of the day, Tom's influence has led many to discover how powerful a fist and foot can be. With photographer Melinda Levine, I am Jenna Lund reporting for Studio One. Tom says the suits he wears cost around $1,500. They have protective padding so students can practice defensive moves in full force. Coming up in our Studio One Spotlight story, we'll tell you about a family that has an unusual pastime. That story and more in the next half hour of Studio One. Hello Studio One from KXJB TV in Fargo, North Dakota. I'm Shauna Olson. And I'm Eric Hansen. 300 shows, what an accomplishment. We are happy to be part of your past. And wish you continued success in the future. North Dakota has been home to many successful entrepreneurs. George Bull and his partners found value in farina, the whitest part of wheat, and created cream of wheat. Patrick Haggerty is the founder of one of the nation's high-tech giants, Texas Instruments. And Raymond Rood's product has been used in every Olympic competition since 1960. He is responsible for the modern diving board. Ryan Foltz is the first graduate of the UND Entrepreneurship Program. Are you next? The University of North Dakota Alumni Association and Foundation, together with thousands of alumni and friends, are making a difference at UND. Thanks to generous private support, many students have experienced the rich history, tradition, and spirit of the University of North Dakota. UND alumni and friends understand the importance of education and are proud to be part of UND's growth and success. Learn how your gift to the UND Foundation can benefit you and your university. You can make a difference. Earn a degree in engineering while you continue to work. The University of North Dakota's Distance Engineering Degree Program offers the only ABET accredited undergraduate degree program at a distance. Instructors and classes are delivered to you through online lectures and condensed on-campus laboratories. It's convenient, it's flexible, and it's a quality education. UND Continuing Education and the School of Engineering and Mines. Teaming up to bring quality education to your door. Tradition runs deep among American Indian people. One of those traditions is helping others. At the University of North Dakota, American Indian Student Services is dedicated to helping students succeed. Our support services include tutoring and financial aid assistance. We have more American Indian programs than any other university in the U.S., making UND a leader in Indian education. Be a part of our tradition. Call 1-800-CALL-UND. From the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, this is Studio One. Welcome back to Studio One. Thanks for joining us today. Well, there was a recent lift on an um, automatic weapon gun ban, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of having the public on half and half. Yeah, there's the, always two sides to that right, story. The police and law enforcement are for the or for the ban, mm -hmm. and gun owners and people who like to do target shooting and things like that are actually against the yeah or, against yeah. lifting of the ban. <laughs> right, 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 right. So they like to have the opportunity to buy guns. And right. I know we did go out and talk to a few people about that. We got some varied answers, of course, on that. Also coming up in the next 30 minutes on Studio One, a terrorist attack can happen without warning. We'll tell you what some are doing to be prepared. Also, many dream of reliving the Old West. In our Studio One Spotlight, we'll tell you how some are getting that chance. And nearly every college campus has high-speed internet. Coming up, we'll talk to someone who tries to keep things moving quickly on the net. 
But first, here's today's news with Phil Zubrod. Thanks, Monty and Kerry. Several car bombs in Baghdad killed more than 50 people on Thursday and wounded many more. 34 of the deaths were children. The bombings were aimed at several Iraqi government targets. One of the blasts occurred during a ceremony where U.S. troops were handing out candy to children. Defense Secretary Ron Donald Rumsfeld predicts that the violence will only get worse as Iraq's January elections get closer. Within the past week, Mount St. Helens, an active volcano in Washington state, has shown signs of life. Seismologists have seen over 1,000 small earthquakes erupt near the dome. The last time that Mount St. Helens erupted was in 1980. The lava flowed as far as 250 miles away and coated nearby towns in ash. Scientists say that any future eruption would be much smaller than the 1980 blast. The reported number of lost or damaged cell phones around the U.S. is increasing. Because of this, most cell phone companies are now offering insurance. Cell phone insurance is similar to your car or home insurance. You pay a monthly premium, which for a cell phone is usually no more than 3 or $4 each month. One re reason people hesitate to buy insurance is because the deductible can be expensive if a replacement is ever needed. But many still feel it's worth it. It'll cost you 50 bucks out of pocket versus 200 minimum up towards 400 you know, if you ever need to use the insurance, it paid for itself four times over immediately. Some of the latest cell phones have built-in cameras which make them more expensive, but Ewald says the price of the phone usually makes no difference on the amount you pay for insurance. A surgery found only in science fiction movies may, may soon be real in hospitals. A team of doctors from the University of Louisville and the Netherlands say they are ready to perform a face transplant. The procedure attaches the face of a dead donor to someone with a severely disfigured face, such as a burn or accident victim. Doctors say the new face will perform like a normal one. Some medical experts are questioning the ethics of such a procedure. The doctors are not yet looking for candidates. They say they will perform the, the surgery when they receive approval from a medical review board. September 11th caught the nation off guard, but now new training programs are teaching medical personnel how to prepare for future disasters. It's something emergency responders hope they never have to face. A terrorist attack with many casualties. Mommy. Mommy. Oh, my mommy. Here at Camp Grafton, just outside Devil's Lake, North Dakota, healthcare professionals are learning to cope with situations like this. Many health professionals realize the need for this kind of training. They hope the program will sharpen their skills in the event of a catastrophe. We're learning how to sort through a, a, a disaster involving lots of people that would quickly overwhelm one facility. How do you sort them out? Where do you go with them? What do you, how do you even at approach the problem? A new training program called Borders is holding this mass triage. The scenario involves a fake explosion with different types of casualties. 65 people are participating in the mass triage. Borders plans to use online training as well as individuals like Dr. Breitweiser to train other healthcare professionals around North Dakota. The creators of the program say these courses are essential in any area of the country. We began working on these programs because we felt like there was a real lack of training of most, if not all, of health care providers. Uh, obviously, the, the need became great after September the 11th. After today's training, North Dakota's top health professionals hope they're better prepared for any tragedy. With photographer Bailey Nordine, I'm Kaylee Hamilton reporting for Studio One News. Once Borders gets established in North Dakota, they hope to take the program to others in the U.S. and Canada. And that's the news for now. Monty and Kerry? Thanks a lot, Phil. Well, I know after the September 11th attacks, they really did put a lot of money and effort into training a lot of first responder units. Right, and first responders don't only, you know, they do that part, and then they also help oh, with natural disasters like the hurricanes that are going on yeah. in the south. So Very important. Right, so why don't we go over to Aaron Swanson over at the Regional Weather Information Center and He's going to tell us more about some of the hurricanes. Yeah, well, thanks, Monty and Carrie. Yeah, Florida has just seen a barrage of hurricanes over the past few months, uh, leaving many of the beaches with much of their sand being relocated across that region. And also, there's just been a tremendous amount of sand that's been moved around everywhere. Uh, Hurricane Charlie caused major erosion on North Captiva Island, which is southwest of Florida. It cut a path a third of a mile wide, splitting the barrier island into two. Lots of the sand that Ivan moved around is now piled into streets and yards and around many buildings. Florida spends roughly $30 million a year to restore their beaches 
In hindsight, economists have determined every dollar spent on beach restoration brings in roughly eight dollars for tourist spending. So that's kind of a very good plus uh, to see that. At least they'll see some benefit coming back from that. Well, beach erosion is naturally occurring throughout the year, but during the late summer and into fall, hurricanes become more of a threat to the shoreline. When, the combi or when combined with a hurricane storm surge, the, de uh, demand, excuse me, the damaging effects on the coast are amplified and can be de devastating in this that area. This fall, the southeast has been under constant threat from Mother Nature. Week after week, torrential rain and gale force winds have devastated the area. While these conditions are destructive, a hurricane's most deadly trait is often what's called storm surge. The reason that storm surge occurs is uh, the winds swirl around a hurricane and um, it causes the water level to rise. Also, it has to do with uh, the, the pressure in a hurricane is really low, so that also causes a rise in the water level. In Category 5 hurricanes like Hurricane Ivan, there is the chance of seeing 20-foot storm surge. When Hurricane Ivan made landfall in the U.S. as a Category 4, it was already packing a storm surge of 16 feet. Storm surge has the most potential uh, to cause loss of life um, because of the rapid rise in the water levels. Water levels can come up um, 10 feet within you know, the course of a half hour. Historically, storm surge has claimed 9 out of 10 victims when related to hurricanes. But with better forecasting from meteorologists, that ratio has been dropping as well as total loss of life in hurricanes. I'm Rob Parrish, reporting for Studio One. The slope of the continental shelf all off the coast also affects the height of the storm surge. Uh, the shallow the slope, the greater the storm surge will be. And Monty here, here's our look at our studio one other IQ question. How many days in the last two months have we not seen a named storm in the Atlantic Ocean? And it is five days. So since August, we've only seen five days where there's been no activity in the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of hard to believe. Monty Carey? All right, thanks, Aaron. That is hard to believe. I don't know. That's a lot of storms mm -hmm. in a you know, in a long period of time. Right, and it's such a shame the beaches there are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. so. Well, they'll recover, right. I'm sure. Yep. Well, let's go now again to sports with Greg Anchors. Thanks, Monty and Kerry. Duck hunters often must use a call to attract the birds before they can take their shot. They don't usually get to test their calls against those of other hunters, but one contest gave them that opportunity. The goal of these callers is not to attract ducks. Instead, they are hoping to attract judges. Outdoorsmen of all ages gathered in East Grand Forks, Minnesota to determine who's the best at calling waterfowl. With routines including a hail call, a feeding call, and a comeback call, They put their best call forward in this unique competition. You look for how the routine is put together, mistakes that they could make, and the overall flow of the routine. To ensure a fair contest, the judges view the competitors as blocked, so they have just one thing to help them decide who's the best. A shotgun is the top prize in every division except youth. The kids are competing for something else. A robo duck. On this day, Corey Barrett gave the best call in the youth division and took home the top prize. In the 13 to 17 year old division, it was Cole Solvling with the winning call. Although there is only one prize per division, nobody leaves empty handed. And just for signing up, you get a free call and the hat. I'm Tyler Tupa, reporting for Studio One. This year's World Duck Calling Championship will be held Thanksgiving weekend in Stuttgart, Arkansas. The winner takes home close to $15,000 in prizes. And now the answer to this week's Studio One Sports Trivia question, in what year was Gatorade invented? And your answer there is D, 1965. The drink was invented by Dr. Robert Cade at the University of Florida and is appropriately named after the Florida Gators. And that's the sports. Monty and Kerry? Thanks a lot, Greg. Pets love being near their owners. We'll take a look at one business that caters to pets whose owners are away at work all day. Also, the Wild West may be a thing of the past, but coming up in our Spotlight Story, we'll show you how some are bringing it back to life. Hello Studio One from WJLA-TV in Washington, D.C. I'm Adam Kasky and I'm a proud alumnus of Studio One. I wish I could be there to help you celebrate 300 shows. Congratulations and keep up the great work. 
Wall Street has come to the prairie through the A. Kirk Lannerman Investment Center at the University of North Dakota. This state-of-the-art facility in the College of Business and Public Administration provides hands-on experience in the world of modern finance. Students learn how financial markets react with lightning quickness to world events. They use cutting-edge technology and real-time data from more than 200 financial markets around the world. The Lanterman Investment Center provides the tools to make a career out of an education. There are many things to be found at the University of North Dakota School of Law. You will find a place with small class settings, an affordable place that offers student interaction with both the state and federal court systems. You will find a school that has averaged over 90% placement for its graduates the past five years. But most importantly, you will find the skills and experience you'll need throughout your legal career. Find your future at the University of North Dakota School of Law. This can happen. Excuse me, can I get a ride? What? My car broke down. Can I get a ride? No, I can't help you. Look, it's just a ride. No, step back. Get in the car! No! <laughs> Women can defend themselves. To learn more about Impact U or to enroll in a class, call the UND Women's Center. Advance your career with a graduate business degree from the University of North Dakota. The Graduate School at UND offers a variety of master's degrees that can help you stand out in the competitive business world. Our programs accommodate full-time students as well as working professionals. Our state-of-the-art facilities, dedicated faculty, and entrepreneurial training position graduates for careers as business leaders. Make your move towards a business leadership position. Contact the UND Graduate School today. Many families search for the perfect daycare. One daycare can handle almost anything, even kids with tails, teeth, and collars. No. Sally, Licorice, and Brock are not your typical daycare kids. At Ruffin at Doggy Daycare in Grand Forks, North Dakota, dogs get the attention they lack when they are home alone. The doggy parents can drop off their pooches for an eventful day. There are doggy games, socialization with other dogs, and not to mention, a leisure room, fully equipped with a TV and VCR. It kind of makes them feel more at home though, having a TV in the background. The doggy daycare is just like a real daycare. You have the shy dogs, the playful dogs, and the dogs that just won't leave you alone. One element is obvious. The staff loves the daycare dogs almost like they're their own children. When I come here, it's so hard to leave. It's so hard to leave. We just love them to pieces. They're all kind of like my kids now, though. So <laughs> People always ask me if I'm going to get another dog, and I say, no, I have all these dogs now, so I don't need any more. <laughs> Joy says the dog owners can sense their pet's enthusiasm for the daycare. No bones about it. They know that their dogs love it because their dogs tell them in their own way. <laughs> you know, when they are going to go in the car, they think they're going to daycare. <laughs> And it's so much fun to see them all just tuckered out and you know they had a good time that day. And with that good time come sweet dreams of the next fun day at the doggy daycare. With photographer Laisha Kopp, I'm Lindsay Turner reporting for Studio One. Technology will soon play a part at the doggy daycare. Roughing It will install a webcam so pet owners can watch their dogs online while they are at daycare. A 10-year federal ban on assault weapons expired this month. This means firearms like AK-47s can now be legally bought. The end of this ban has critics worried and gun owners pleased. We wanted your thoughts on the gun ban expiration. I think it's bad. Unless, unless you're going to kill people, you don't need an assault weapon. I disagree with it. I don't think assault weapons should be available. I mean, hunting equipment is a different story, but... Assault weapons should be regulated. I'm an outdoorsman and a believer in gun ownership, so I tend to believe in it. I, I'm like anyone, though, concerned with public safety and that. Um, I guess if you're going to allow them, I wouldn't mind seeing maybe some tighter gun control on it. I believe that people shouldn't be able to purchase assault weapons. So I think that it would be good if there was a... Uh, there was that restriction on them. It tells me that there's going to be a few people that will have assault weapons in their possession that have on their mind to assault somebody or many people. 
From a story of a gun debate to a tale of guns used for recreation. In today's Spotlight Story, we'll tell you about a group who not only likes to shoot, but also immerses themselves in the experience. Peace and quiet, the perfect family vacation. Pack up the kids and spend a relaxing weekend at the campground. Just the ideal getaway from all the noise of the city. But not for the Burkett family. Forget the sweet melodies of a songbird. They prefer the pop of a gun. Welcome to the world of SAS. SAS is, stands for the Single Action Shooting Society. Uh, it's been around since about 1980, 81 I believe. We, we got started here just as a way to, another way to shoot uh, some firearms that, that we all had at home in our closets. Shotguns, six shooters and stage coaches are all just another part of this unique group. But what gets them excited the most is the chance to leave their suits and skirts at home. I had some fantastic clothes. You get to be a cowboy, you get to relive that era and if you like that era it is just a wonderful opportunity. We dress the part. You can pick different characters or different personas. Uh, some pick an actual character out of history and, and, and dress that part. Uh, some just dressed up western, you know. Take all the clothes, throw in some unusual Old West names. Jackalope will be shooting, limpy loading. And you've got yourself a rockin' 80s party. 1880s that is. However at this party they get a chance to rob a bank with Jesse James, hold an ambush at the OK Corral, or stage a shootout at high noon. But SAS isn't just about getting dressed up and showing off your best guns. There's an accuracy and speed competition too. No matter who wins, everyone is sure to have a good time. The common rivalry that we have and you know, you're shooting against somebody but yet you're there to support them and give them the initiative or you know, the positive feedback. So after a long weekend of guns and games, it's time for the Burkett family vacation to end. But there's no doubt that this family will saddle up again whenever given the chance. This is Corey Morlock reporting for Studio One. Members say they also use the competitions as a way to promote gun safety. They say it is a great way to reach out to the community in a unique way. Computer users often download music and movies from the internet. Next, we'll talk to someone who helps decide what people download from the web. Hello, Studio One. This is KVRR-TV in Fargo, North Dakota. We are proud to congratulate you on your 300th show. As Studio One alumni, we are proud to say we are part of your very rich and long history, and we look forward to hundreds of shows to come. No matter what your schedule, no matter when you work, no matter what job you have now, this is your opportunity to accomplish your goals. Degrees After Hours at the University of North Dakota can work around your busy schedule. Bachelor and Master's degrees are earned through convenient, flexible, and high quality classes. Complete degrees are available online through correspondence study and on weekends and evenings. Earn a degree on your terms with Degrees After Hours at the University of North Dakota. Wall Street has come to the prairie through the A. Kirk Lannerman Investment Center at the University of North Dakota. This state-of-the-art facility in the College of Business and Public Administration provides hands-on experience in the world of modern finance. Students learn how financial markets react with lightning quickness to world events. They use cutting-edge technology and real-time data from more than 200 financial markets around the world. The Lannerman Investment Center provides the tools to make a career out of an education. The School of Engineering and Mines at UND has a long history of preparing students for successful careers. Through small classes and faculty involvement, students have unique opportunities to gain hands-on experience. Here students launch a weather balloon to test a remote imaging device destined for Earth orbit. Students can also become involved in wind energy and fuel cell projects, design, build and race a Formula One car, or even develop a camera that will generate agricultural images from the International Space Station. Find out for yourself how you can get involved at UND School of Engineering and Mines. 
The UND College of Business and Public Administration is reaching out to rural America. The Government Rural Outreach Initiative is working to connect North Dakota veterans with important information. North Dakota veterans can use the internet to access employment and business resources, health and benefits they deserve, housing information, and much more. The Government Rural Outreach Initiative is funded in part by the North Dakota Congressional Delegation. North Dakota veterans and their families can get connected by visiting go.ndgrow.com. Many college students are logged onto the internet at the same time. When students are using technology for things other than schoolwork, it affects the rate at which others learn. UND's Chief Information Officer Jim Schaefer is here to tell us more about bandwidth issues on college campuses. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you to be here on your 300 show. It's well, just a great honor. Thanks for including me. All right. Well, the first question I have for you is, could you maybe give us a basic description of bandwidth? Well, when we think about bandwidth uh, for our, our institutions, what we're talking about is that's the connection to the internet. And for colleges and universities nowadays, that's, that is a necessity that uh, our students, our faculty, and our staff have high speed access to the internet. Well, what impact does bandwidth have then on a network? Well, on our network or any network, what you're looking at is that you have a limited amount of bandwidth on the network and that the more things are, that you put on that, more applications, you're limiting the amount of bandwidth that you have so things just start to slow down, which is not a good thing. Well, most people know that computers use the internet. What other types of devices are you seeing now? Using well, the of course, the, the computers are, are, you, are, are really a source for what's going on uh, on the internet. Um, but what they're doing is that they're accessing movies, they're accessing uh, songs. We've got, uh, we run meetings on the internet now. Uh, we do teleconferences on the internet. So there are a number of things that, that now are utilizing the bandwidth that we have. As a CIO, how much, or how do you decide, determine how, how much bandwidth is available? Well, what we've done is, uh, obviously you start out with a limited amount because of the money that you have. But what we've done is we step back as an institution. We've said, now, what is the appropriate use for this? And uh, at most institutions, what we're finding is that teaching, learning, and research are the uh, most appropriate uses for our, our network. With more types of technology out there, um, does the bandwidth need to expand? Are you seeing a need for an expansion? Well, certainly uh, every day I, I look out there and I think, gee, I wish we had more bandwidth. Uh, think how much more we could do. Uh, but the first place to start is to take a look at what you have and, and try to manage that and make sure that you're using what you've got in the best way that you can. And, and what that does mean sometimes is some things won't get the bandwidth that they want. Well, can you allocate bandwidth to specific parts of campuses? Yeah, we can do a couple of things in terms of that. It's uh, the, the, what it's called is bandwidth shaping. And what we do is that based on the application, we can allow more bandwidth to go to certain places uh, and allow less bandwidth, for example, like downloading songs. Uh, we can control how much bandwidth is available for that. Is the cost of expanding the bandwidth then starting to affect campuses? Um, actually, the good news is, is that we're seeing the cost of bandwidth, it's going down. And so the, uh, on, on the horizon is as institutions need to buy more bandwidth, it, it, it is affordable or at least getting more affordable. But again, where you want to start, at least from my uh, point of view, is managing what you've got and using it to the best of your ability. I think many people associate expansion with good. Um, <laughs> what are some problems that are arising with expanded bandwidth? Well, the thing is, is that you never have enough. Um, if, if we were to all of a sudden expand bandwidth, say, to our residence halls, the bad thing is, or the good thing is, is suddenly there's all that bandwidth. The bad thing is it may take two people uh, to utilize all the bandwidth so that not everyone is getting uh, to be able to use the good uh, of the expanded bandwidth. How big of an issue is this in other places? It's a big issue everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, all of the CIOs that I talk to, what they're trying to do is figure out, one, how should we be using the bandwidth, and two, how do we allocate the bandwidth? And uh, one of the things I've learned, there's never enough. Well, can these pop any problems be monitored at all? Sure. Uh, I talked about bandwidth shaping. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have uh, machines that we utilize that will tell us how it's being used, uh, in some cases where it's being used. And we can even get down to a point where if we have somebody who's using a lot of bandwidth, we can figure out which computer that is and go in and basically drop them from the network if we need to do that. 
Well, as technology is expanding, um, how do you think that um, bandwidth will be handled in the future? I think that uh, what we probably will see is more of what we're doing now, and that is, is uh, trying to use what we've got wisely. I think what the other thing that we'll see is that we'll come up with ways to be able to access things with less bandwidth. So whatever we have, uh, we'll be able to get more. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thank you. You're watching Studio One from the University of North Dakota. We'll be right back after this. Can you hear me back here? Okay. Very good. Tradition runs deep among American Indian people. One of those traditions is helping others. At the University of North Dakota, American Indian Student Services is dedicated to helping students succeed. Our support services include tutoring and financial aid assistance. We have more American Indian programs than any other university in the U.S., making UND a leader in Indian education. Be a part of our tradition. Call 1-800-CALL-UND. The Graduate School at the University of North Dakota is the premier graduate school of the Northern Great Plains, offering advanced degrees in more than 50 fields of study. Our innovative and flexible programs give full-time students, as well as working professionals, the opportunity to study under the guidance of nationally and internationally recognized faculty. Advance your career with a master's or doctoral degree from the Graduate School at the University of North Dakota. When you graduate from college, what will you be able to offer an employer? Well, I love working with people. I'm a people person. I consider myself to be highly motivated. I'm a real self-starter. Offer an employer something more. At the University of North Dakota Career Services Center, we can help you get the competitive edge you need. Stop in or check us out. UND Career Services, empowering students to realize their dreams. I can offer you much more than just good people skills. You're hired. No matter what your schedule, no matter when you work, no matter what job you have now, this is your opportunity to accomplish your goals. Degrees After Hours at the University of North Dakota can work around your busy schedule. Bachelor and Master's degrees are earned through convenient, flexible, and high-quality classes. Complete degrees are available online through correspondence study and on weekends and evenings. Earn a degree on your terms with Degrees After Hours at the University of North Dakota. This can happen. Excuse me, can I get a ride? What? My car broke down. Can I get a ride? No, I can't help you. Look, it's just a ride. No, step back. Get in the car! No! <laughs> Women can defend themselves. To learn more about Impact U or to enroll in a class, call the UND Women's Center. Tune in next week on Studio One. Back pain is a crippling condition. We'll talk with a doctor who deals with children who have back problems. Plus, we'll have other news and entertainment stories for you. Well, that was our 300 show. Yes, we're just about wrapped up now. Do you have any interesting info or any, any trivial-like questions? To mm, historical yeah, tidbits yeah. about Studio One after 17 years being on the air. <laughs> Maybe that... Uh, when we talked to Tom earlier in the show, he mm -hmm. had mentioned two people, Barry Brody and Dale Rickey. Yep. Those are the only two remaining original uh, crew members from that very first season that it started. And wow. they're still doing a great job with us today. Congrats to them. Yeah, congrats <laughs> to them. And uh, we hope to be on the air for many, many more years. Welcome again to our new, uh, our new viewers in Denver area. We're glad you could join us and everybody else across the region as well. Thank you for helping us celebrate our 300th show. We hope you will join us again and again, and we've got confetti flying at us and everything. Oh my goodness. Well, we're going to leave you now with pictures of rugby, and that's courtesy of photographer Melinda Levine, and I wish I could give you some of this confetti. From all of us here at Studio One, have a great week.